me. Okay, uh, let me pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the time that we can gather like this and we just ha help us to understand your word and uh, bless our time together. We uh, ask for safe travel for the Myers that come up here and uh, just thank you for all you've done for us. We pray in Jesus name. Amen. Okay, so we are now on chapter 27. I think there are what 31 chapters in the book, if I recall, maybe 32. So we're getting north toward the end. Last week we dealt with the crucifixion. And of course, the resurrection is the most uh is a very important part of of the redemption story of, of God, because had Jesus not risen from the dead, he would be no different than, than uh, anyone else who died, but he rose and he rose in, in bodily form. Uh, it, you remember last week, I talked about how at the resurrection or at the crucifixion, a, a person really died uh, of, of asphyxiation because they could not breathe. They had to stand up and, in order to get a breath, and it was a long and, and very agonizing way to die. Uh, but And so what the soldiers would do, would they would come along and break the legs of the, of the, of the criminal, and uh, they, did, they came around to do that because the Sabbath day was coming. It was uh, uh, sundown was coming, so they came to break uh, Jesus' legs, and at that point he had already said from the cross, uh, it is finished, and he had uh, given up uh his spirit uh and so really uh in in reality they didn't kill him he he just gave up the ghost well they did kill him but um so uh anyway he he died and uh joseph of arimathea and nicodemus nicodemus being the pharisee that came to jesus in john chapter three uh he was the he came with Joseph of Arimathea and requested the body of John, this uh, body of Jesus, excuse me, and uh, this is recorded in the book of John. At the top of the sheet there, you'll notice I put the uh, passages that covered this story. And so he, uh, they get the, uh, the body of Jesus and they, he buries him in his tomb, actually, and they put a big stone over it and uh, then on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, uh, not uh, not Jesus' mother, comes and uh, comes to the tomb to in order to uh, anoint the body of Jesus with uh, with whatever they anointed the dead bodies with. And when they got there, they found the stone had been rolled away and the body was gone. Um, and and uh, they uh, they really don't know what to do, and they get word to Peter and John, and Peter and John run to the tomb, and they still at this point do not understand what's happened. In fact, uh, Mary says uh, to the angel, "There, where where have you taken his body?" And um, and the and the uh, angel says, "He's not here. He has risen." And uh, so Peter and they get word to Peter and James. Uh, Peter and John, and they run to the tomb, and they uh, then they, they look in, and they can't find him. Uh, and then Mary later on is outside the tomb, and Jesus appears to her. And uh, at first she does not recognize him, and then uh, when she does, she uh, she calls him Rabbi. And uh, and so for the next uh, forty days, um, Jesus appears and disappears from his followers. Uh, he, in, in Luke chapter 24, is a fascinating story of two of the disciples there are unnamed on the road to Emmaus. And uh, as they're walking along, this stranger shows up and begins to walk with them. And uh, at first, he kind of, he pleads uh, ignorant. The guy, the stranger, is like, well, what, what's what's all the uproar? And, and they say, well, you haven't heard. And they go on to tell about how, uh, what had happened in Jerusalem over the weekend and uh, so uh, he again he then begins to talk to them and he begins to uh, explain everything that's happened in light of the old testament i would have loved to have been in that meeting it would have been a great uh, walk uh, and then of course at the end when they get to where they're going they realize it's jesus he has been walking with them 
all this time and explaining that everything has happened has has been a fulfillment of the uh, of the Old Testament prophets. And then once he appears to them, or once he uh, opens his eyes, he uh, then uh, disappears. And then over the next few days, he appears to his disciples uh, multiple times in 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 different places, and uh, and he reveals himself to them, and uh, and of course they're they're amazed. Uh, I uh, I think this is when they finally uh, actually. Uh, believed, uh, you know, uh, in in Jesus, they had been working up to it, but they certainly believe by now. But they report to Thomas, who is also known as Doubting Thomas, and they tell Thomas about it. And Thomas says, "Well, I'm not. I don't believe it. I don't believe it, and uh, I won't believe it until I see the, the the scars in his hand and his side, and I won't believe it." So Jesus uh, appears to. Uh, he appears to the disciples later when Thomas is there and he says, Hey, Tommy boy. He didn't call him Tommy boy. <laughs> he, he said, here, come and, uh, and put your finger in these scars. And of course, Thomas, uh, uh, claims you are the, you are, you are God. And, uh, he pro professes his faith. My Lord and my God is, I believe is what he says. And then Jesus makes a very interesting statement in, in re in response to Thomas's uh, seeing Jesus, he says, you know, Thomas, it's not a big deal. You have seen, and now you believe. There will be so many people after you that will not see and yet believe. And, of course, he's talking about us. We've never seen him. And he commends us at that moment in with, uh, with Thomas, again, found in these chapters, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. By the way, I don't know if I if I talked to you about this. Did I ever talk to you about the four Gospels and the fact that three of them are called synoptics, synoptic Gospels? Did I ever say say no. that? Okay. No. Let me give you a brief, uh, brief uh, tell you a little bit about that. There are four Gospels, obviously Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Interestingly enough, of that is only two of the Gospels were written by uh, Jesus. Uh, disciples that was matthew and john the book of mark was written by a guy by the name of john mark uh, who actually was a disciple of the apostle paul later on in paul's ministry in and when we get to the book of acts we'll talk about that uh luke was a companion of the apostle paul luke was a uh a uh, he he was in uh, Paul's entourage, and he was a he was a, a a physician, so he's very educated. And next week, when we talk about the beginning of the early church, we will be dealing with the Book of Acts, which is uh, is a book that Luke wrote. But anyway, uh, the three Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptic gospels because they are very similar in their reports. Uh, they're they're the eyewitness accounts of Matthew, and then the reported accounts that Mark and Luke wrote down, because they were getting their information later on, and they're very parallel in, in the reporting that they, they do. John, uh, the Gospel of John, approaches it from a different perspective, and it makes sense because John was actually in the inner circle of Jesus, and while the stories are similar, uh, the events are similar, I should say. There's other things in John that are that are not recorded in the other three Gospels. So that's what the three synoptics, which means synonymous, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. And then John is kind of an outlier. It's not that there's a different story. He covers different things. For example, he's the one that dealt with the uh, uh, raising of Lazarus. He's the one that dealt with the uh, uh, water to wine in Canaan uh, and that. So uh, does that make sense? So you got, It does. Yeah. So... Uh, and they they give a little different perspective on the on the three years that Jesus uh, was in ministry, and so uh, John records a, a very comforting story, uh, which is the restoration of Peter. And if you and I mentioned, I think I mentioned it all the time. Peter's my favorite. Uh, he was always opening his mouth and sticking his foot in it, and uh, he he claimed to uh, Jesus that he would never deny him, but of course he did and was was heartbroken and uh and in the book of john um 
John records the restoration of Peter. And I put that passage there in your uh, notes. He said, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Uh, and he said to him, Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. And then he said a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he, Peter said, uh, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said a third, to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Uh, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, to, wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show him by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to Jesus, follow me. Or he, And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. So in the, uh, in the printout that I gave you, I, I highlighted the, the various words of our love, right? Did that show up in your... Um, the first two are in yellow. The last five are in blue. Uh, in in Greek, and I'm not a Greek scholar, but in Greek, uh, there are two words in the Bible that are translated in English uh, into the word love. Uh, the one word is the Greek word agape, uh, agape, and the second word is the word phileo, and phileo is the word from which we get Philadelphia. Uh, it is uh, it is a brotherly love. It's what there's a love between brothers. The word agape is is a very intense. It's an unconditional love, um, and it's the highest form of love that you can have for someone. Uh, and so, what Jesus is saying to Peter, uh, son of John, do you do you agape me? Do you love me at the highest kind of love? And Peter responds to him. I love you like a brother. And then Jesus says it again in the second time. Do you love me, Peter, with the highest form of love? And Peter says, I love you like a brother. And uh, then Jesus says to him the third time, Simon, do you love me like a brother? And uh, Peter responds, Lord, you know I love you like a brother. What I think is very significant about this, if you remember Peter, Peter's the one that was always boasting about how great he was. And so when Jesus said to him, and by the way, why did why do you think Jesus asked him three times if he loved him, if Peter loved him? Any idea? I don't know. He denied Jesus three times. Three times, that's and, right. Uh, and I, I think that's what's significant to this. There's nowhere that that's written down. But um, he said, uh, uh, and I think what Peter, you know, in the old days, Peter would said, "Of course, I agape you." I mean, look at me, I'm Peter. And he, and he, to Jesus, he could not say that. He could say, "No, I'm not sure. I love you that much." I. I love you. I love you like a brother. And then, then Jesus. And by the way, phileo love is good love. Brotherly love is good love. It's not that it's not. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's bad. Uh, but uh, and so we see this in this in this story. We see first of all the compassion and the forgiveness of Christ. Right? Uh, uh, he's he seeks Peter out to uh, to restore him and. Uh, and of course, we know and we'll see next week when we begin the book of Acts that uh, Peter, he, Peter did a, uh, Peter was a, was a very, was a pillar in the early uh, group of people that, uh, that reached the world with the gospel. Uh, and ultimately he gave his life. Uh, it is, uh, it is believed that Peter was crucified himself and was crucified upside down. 
uh, and because he didn't want to die the same way Jesus did. That's tradition. There, there's nowhere in the Bible where that is taught, but that that's pretty well uh, um, an accepted fact. We see here the compassion of Jesus. We see here the humility of Peter uh, in his restoration, and then ultimately see, we see that this uh, this event was life changing. Peter came out of this uh, time uh, as a, a very strong and dedicated follower of Jesus to the point that he gave his life. I, I did not include this in the John 21 passage, but if you read the next section, uh, right after uh, he says, uh, after he's saying this, he said to him, follow me. John the apostle re records this. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them the one who had also leaned back against him during the supper. And he said, Lord, who is, uh, and had said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So uh, that saying spread abroad among the brothers that the disciples, that this disciple, John, was not to die Yet Jesus did not say that he was not going to die, but that if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? So Peter looks around, says, sees John, and he says to Jesus, well, what about John? What's going to happen to John? Jesus said, don't worry about it. You just follow me. And, and you know, I think that's a, that's a great example for us because I want to know a lot of times, well, what's going to happen to them? And, and Jesus says, don't worry about it. You follow me. You focus on me. And uh, so that was a life-changing event. And then the last event of this section is what is called the Great Commission. And it is recorded uh, a couple of different places. But the most uh, the most familiar one is found in Matthew 28. That is these are the last two verses of Matthew. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe that all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So he gives a commission to his uh, disciples that they are to go and they are to make disciples. What's a disciple? A dis oh, yeah, a disciple oh, is a follower. Yeah, a follower of Jesus, a student. Mm -hmm. Um and uh, part of that is uh, baptizing them uh, and then teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And uh, behold, I'm with you always uh, to the end of the age. Uh, and this, one of the reasons that I, we take this commission as, uh, as to us today is that for one, it fits. But also he says, behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Well, these disciples all died within 60 years. And yet he's with us to the end of the age. Uh, do you know how many days it was between the next, between uh, the resurrection and the ascension into heaven, which we will cover next week? Do you know, how many, can you guess how many days? Let me give you the over under. 50. Over, what's that? Was it 33? You're close. You're very close. Wait. 27, 33? It's 40 days. 40 days. 40 days. 40 days. So all of these events that we, we just talked about take place somewhere within that 40-day period. And the Great Commission, as, as when we get to Acts next week, uh, and we'll read this again, um, uh, Luke writing this said he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God and while saying and while staying with them he ordered them not to depart from the Jerusalem but to wait for the father which he said you heard from me for John baptized with water but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit uh, and then he goes later on in verse eight, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And then this verse, and when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. 
And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you have seen him go into heaven. So he's coming back. So the last thing that at the after the Great Commission, Jesus then went out and uh, he ascended into heaven. And uh, from that moment, um, he was gone. And these disciples, which totaled uh, with the disciples and his followers, totaled about 120 people. And 120 people changed the world. So that's the lesson for today. Uh, my presentation. Do you have any uh, any questions or comments or thoughts? I don't have any, and Dave's saying no. He had a question at the very beginning, but I think you answered it. Am I really that good? I think you are. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, great. Well, uh, good to see you. I hope it works out to see you this weekend. That'd be that'd be terrific. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. Uh, so, uh, have a safe trip, and uh, we will see you later. I'm going to stop the recording.